Somehow, I don't think this is what they meant by be gay, do crimes, but hey, equal opportunity scamming is the American dream. If you like anti-scam content on YouTube, if you were weirdly obsessed with Theranos, hey, me too, no judgment, but if that is the case, then Confidence by Raphael Frumkin may be for you as your next read. And honestly, what a great way to start out the new year because there is an element of self-help satire to it, and the whole thing is a kind of satire look at the idea of the American dream through an elaborate scam and pyramid scheme and self-help culty retreat, basically taking a wry, comedic, satirical look at all of these things that I am personally really interested in. And we've looked at some of the darker side of this through things like natural beauty and rouge. But here we have a much more tongue-in-cheek take on the whole thing through the eyes of a couple of scammers, particularly through the eyes of our protagonist, Ezra. And the fact that his vision isn't so hot is a main part of the book. He is dealing with the loss of his vision throughout the course of the thing, which, yeah, sure, that's a metaphor. It also had me very aware of my own vision. I cannot see well. I am not anywhere close to the level of Ezra in the book or even some of my friends. But reading about this character talk about his deteriorating, hard word to say oddly, vision made me very aware of my own vision. And he does start to develop glaucoma. And then the way he doesn't take care of himself, I don't know, that's a whole extra element. But obviously, we do have this extra layer of him not seeing things clearly. However, that does not mean he's off the hook and he's just mindlessly complicit. Throughout this whole thing, we're following Ezra, who is our protagonist, our anti-hero of sorts, and his partner in crime, Orson. And we see this very interesting dynamic that develops between the two of them after they meet at one of those kind of scary right camps, juvie camps, basically. Now, even there, they have this elaborate contraband business. And so we watch them kind of evolve from petty crimes to starting a cult and a pyramid scheme and this elaborate business that is making multi-million dollars and is involved internationally. So the rise is meteoric and we do skip a lot because we are kind of getting the highlights. This is coming out of an author that came through the Iowa Writers Workshop, which I only mentioned because that means, at least to me as a reader, that the writing is probably going to be a little bit more stylized. Like I said, there is a sense of humor to this writing. There is a levity to it, even when we are really dealing Dealing with some darker themes and characters that are not good people, would not be likable people, would not be people I would ever want to hang out with. But they also have this magnetism to them, and that is part of the exploration. Like, how are we again and again swindled by these kinds of people? And also just how these kinds of people, these kinds of scammers, are fun to watch on some level. And so because we are skipping around, it may feel to some readers like we aren't getting to know the characters as deeply. However, this is, as you surely can guess, a very specific choice. And I think it's made for a couple of reasons. On one hand, especially because we are seeing this through Ezra's point of view, it shows how much he as a character in some ways is distanced from the crimes. He makes them make sense to him logically. He justifies them in a lot of ways. The biggest way being his obsession with Orson, which we will circle back to. But it also keeps us from looking too closely at the crimes. One, I would argue for the sense of distance narratively, where then we start to become more intrigued with these characters in some ways. We are removing some of the dirtier bits. We still get a lot of dirty bits especially toward the end, don't get me wrong, but it is presented in a very over-the-top kind of satirical manner in a lot of ways. And I think part of the way that it reads this way is because we are so detached from these events in some ways through Ezra's point of view, other than them being the means to an end and the idea of what you can justify once you are on this wheel. Additionally, I think just logistically, it's so we don't have to think too much about the mechanics of the scam. We talk about a little of it, like the embezzling stuff. I don't understand the embezzlement and like the kind of moving of money
money and how we're hiding money, but I understand enough through the narrative to know that what we are doing is very, very illegal. But what is more interesting to me as a reader and my kind of interest in this realm that I think is reflected really well in this book and through the tone and the voice of everything is this idea of the cult of personality. Because here we have a couple of guys who are essentially selling this like meditation, self-help. There's some sprinkling of Scientology in their device that helps you kind of realize your best self in some way. Kind of very typical self-help empty jargon. Another reason it's a great time to explore this, I personally really do not like the self-help genre because I believe that for me it's a lot of regurgitated platitudes that don't have action items. It's a lot of empty words, empty language, and that idea of empty words and empty language is really emphasized here. The sense that at the end of the day these guys are just bullshit artists and they are out for their own benefit and the way that lies can kind of compound and where they'll come back and catch up with you and I think it is so reflective and really tapping in to the modern moment, the modern zeitgeist. There are so many characters in here that feel like sketches or outlines potentially of real people. And I don't mean that in a way where I am critiquing that, but rather, again, it's that satirical look at things and the heavily stylized language, which I don't think is not approachable. It's not stylistic to the point where it's hard to get through. Rather, I think it helps it move quicker because we are moving so quickly. And part of that pacing, too, is the sense that you are caught up in the thing. There's really no time to breathe. The lies compound and how everything kind of builds on itself. So you're like, how did we end up here when we get to the end? And that's where it kind of feels. That being said, when we get to the end, we know where we're going this whole narrative. We start at the beginning with Ezra in jail and the way that he's kind of built a following even in jail and promoting this idea of synthesizing this cult-like thing that has been built up in the book. And so then we go back to how we get there. So we know that that's the moment. And so in a similar way to this kind of obsession with fraudsters, think like your fire fests. Like how did we get to the breakdown? It feels very reminiscent of that. It's this kind of amalgamation of so many things. And we start off with Ezra and Orson as this real partnership in these frauds and these schemes. But at the same time, Ezra has always kind of taken a back seat to Orson. He is being positioned by Orson as the mastermind or to think he's the mastermind in some ways. But Orson is the one usually coming away with more power or prestige or image in whatever way. And Ezra is really basking in Orson's attention. And that does develop into a physical relationship over the course of the book as well. However, it then is usually used, that relationship is used to kind of manipulate Ezra. At least that's how I interpret it. And so Orson is not a character that we really get to know as readers. He is an enigma to us as well. How much of him is sincere and true in his relationship to Ezra? How much of it is him manipulating Ezra just as much as he is manipulating everyone else? What does he believe of his own BS as he kind of delves further and further into this cult thing? of this kind of pseudo-religion he has built up. Even Ezra doesn't really seem to know what is true by the end. And so I think in fiction, especially kind of like the big idea novels, we can talk a lot about the idea of the American dream, the breakdown of the American dream. But here we are really lambasting the American dream and really kind of saying the American dream has always been a scam. It's always been a pyramid scheme. It's always been for the fraudsters and the hucksters and this idea of hustle culture as this empty promise, these empty words with nothing backing up anything. It's all smoke and mirrors. And so for a book where traditionally I might say that I was kept at arm's length and I didn't really get to feel like I knew the characters, I found a lot of dark humor in this book and I really enjoyed myself. It felt like I was watching a couple of scammers get their comeuppance, but it also felt like we were really digging into the how did this succeed? There is a level of complicity as a reader in that. One, because there is a kind of likability 
responsibility to Ezra. Even though I know he's doing these awful things, I can't help but like him at certain points. And even in the book itself, he ends up kind of having a more complicated relationship with another person trying to bring him and his company down. This idea that this man sees the fraud, but also is so taken in by Ezra as well. I think there's also an element when we talk about the ideas of Orson and Ezra as characters and them feeling very larger than life in some ways, that they are more representative. We have this idea of Orson as the kind of golden child in some some ways, and Ezra feels more like an everyman in that Orson is this ideal he's trying to reach or trying to cling on to some of the glory of in some ways. And we have this physically manifested with him losing his sight, him ignoring the loss of his sight, and all of the metaphor that we could unpack there, but also what this means when he's putting himself and when the narrative puts him up against Orson, and how that's also a more generalized commentary on us feeling broken or inferior in whatever way and looking to these unrealistic ideals. And so it feels like a commentary on the cult of personality that develops around these scam artists as well. And while things do move fast, we have that sense of frenzy. There is also a kind of odd stillness at certain times as things start to deteriorate, both with Ezra's vision, with his relationship with Orson, and as things start to spiral out of control in the company, we have this kind of building tension even while they're at the pinnacle of success. So in some ways it feels like we're watching the Netflix special, the Hulu special, after a company that was a media darling crashes and burns and everyone is standing around going, what went wrong? Even when here it's so obvious from the beginning everything's a scam, the whole structure of the book is predicated on the scam, both the big scam that is central to it, but also the early scams that get us there and how they're all interconnected. And I was almost tickled, and it feels wrong to be almost tickled by just how much of kind of scam culture was packed into this book without it feeling forced. We have this idea of their company, New Life. So we have this kind of wellness scam, the cult that develops around this wellness scam. We have the pyramid scheme that develops out of the cult that is a wellness scam. But on top of that also, we have just faulty technology. So we get some Theranos in there. We've got kind of echoes of Firefest, like I said. And so everything is this really amped up satirical version of all of these stories that have been living in the cultural zeitgeist, at least the modern zeitgeist. But at the same time, this is a story as old as time. And so everything is very tight in this novel. While it is quick, while it moves fast, while we have these jumps, at the same time, everything is very intentional. It doesn't waste its breath. It doesn't waste our attention. And I think that that is an interesting part of it as well, because I think it is also an exploration of the way attention plays into a lot of this and how we are distracted by sleight of hand in a lot of ways and how the narrative kind of plays with that as well. And at the end of the day, too many people are enamored of over-the-top fraudsters and that is very much what this is about. Yes, it is a larger commentary on the idea of the American dream and the idea that the American dream is a scam, which a decade, 15 years ago, really blew my mind as a question in college. And now I'm like, I'm kind of tired of the question because the answer feels so obvious. But this felt like it took a new approach to the question, it breathed new life into that conversation in a darkly funny way, and I really appreciated it. Additionally, I really appreciated the inherent queerness of the narrative, even as that becomes more complicated with things in relation to particularly Ezra and Orson's relationship, how Orson pulls away from Ezra as the company kind of takes off. So there are kind of broad strokes in this novel that really kind of pin down fine tune ideas. And I think the novel is almost kind of deceptive because it reads so easily. It feels so simple and matter of fact. And I think that there's a lot of layers in it that are very well maneuvered. I don't know if this is my most insightful analysis to start off the year, but I do think that this book is a great place to start the year off. So with that being said, thanks for hanging out and listening to my thoughts. If there are any books coming out in 2024 that you would love to hear talked about in a feature Friday, let me know. No promises because I am a mood reader, but I promise to take it into consideration. But like and subscribe if you feel like it, read something good, and yeah, bye.